Hi everyone from Viva Tech 2022. If you can't hear the background noise, we are live on the show floor right now and I am with Anthony DiPrinzio, Head of Business Development for Alio. And today we're gonna talk about Web3, what Alio is doing to build privacy in Web3. And uh, yeah, join us right now. We're uh, on the spot live. So Anthony, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and Alio. Thanks so much, Tiffany. Uh, super excited to be on the podcast and talking about these topics. I personally find it super interesting and hopefully your audience will also uh, find it interesting as well. So yeah, I've been working in the crypto and Web3 space since 2016, back when I was an undergrad at UC Berkeley. And ever since then, I've it's the only industry I've actually worked in. So it's a pretty cool path that I've taken so far. And I've been working with Alio since April of 2021, so it's been a little bit over a year, and it's been an amazing experience so far. But in short, you know, what, what is Alio? So basically what we're doing is we are building a developer platform that allows web developers to build private applications on Web3. And one of the important things to consider when talking about Web3 is that it doesn't actually have a lot of privacy preserving primitives baked into it yet. And so Alio really wants to bring more privacy to this ecosystem such that we can open up a wider array of applications that otherwise wouldn't be possible given the current architecture of Web3. And I think during this podcast, we can definitely dive into more specifics about that. but. Yeah, in general, that's sort of what Alio is currently working on. That's super interesting. And yesterday we heard your session, a deep dive into what Alio is doing. And so I'm really excited to get into that as well. And, you know, when I hear privacy Web3, one of the first things that, that I would think is privacy already is in Web3. So maybe you can help us to understand why is this now decentralized web? Where do the privacy issues come in? And maybe we can even go back one step and explain a little bit, you know, what is the difference really between Web 2, Web 3, and where does that privacy come into play? Sure, so that's a great question. I think a lot of people ask themselves this all the time, especially since it's such a rapidly evolving space and things are constantly changing. So if we want to start by taking a step back, the difference between Web 2.0, which is where we are today, so essentially the modern version of the internet that everybody loves and uses, uh, and moving into Web 3, which would be essentially the next evolution of the internet. The main difference is that in Web 2, everything is positioned in a centralized manner. So what we mean by this is the internet itself and all the applications running on it are powered by these individual companies and organizations and centralized services um, that enable us to do everything from like accessing a website to you know um, going on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter and all to these email. sorts of things to email yeah pretty much everything and there are certain limitations that come with that and there's also a lot of um, other issues arising especially when it comes to people having like sovereignty over their data and like information being leaked and misused and so on and so forth and so with web 3 what we're trying to do is essentially build an internet that is not controlled by a vast majority of centralized solutions but more built by a decentralized and more importantly trustless architecture and so what does that mean it basically means that in web 3 the entire network uh, will be functioning and comprised of, of millions of nodes on a network. And when I mean nodes, I just mean computers, right? So just average people or other organizations uh, running these nodes and powering the underlying infrastructure for like this decentralized ecosystem. So in this case, you can still you know, create websites, develop your own uh, decentralized applications is what people are calling it, or dApps for short. 
and all these different interesting use cases, uh, decentralized finance, um, products, you know, people working on like interesting different like use cases in the gaming space that are decentralized to open up new and interesting, you know, uh, gaming mechanics and different kinds of creative, uh, creator economy uh, business models and so on and so forth, and really giving more power to the individuals operating in the system, but still, again, having a secure functioning system. And we could dive into all the specifics about how that works. It's a combination of cryptography, uh, economic incentives and alignment through the use of like tokens or cryptocurrencies, if people are familiar, and all these sorts of things. But that's generally where we're trying to go. And then going into your question about the privacy aspect, um, with Web3, the problem is that the underlying data structures that make up what this network will look like, right? So when all these nodes are interconnected is known as the blockchain. And so maybe people have heard this buzzword before, but really all it is is it's a, a ledger, right? So you can think like if you're familiar with a traditional financial ledger where you're recording transactions um, or different like operations that are happening, uh, that's com it's completely digital, uh, but it's also fully transparent and public. So all of those nodes that are running on the network that I mentioned before, they can all see uh, the blockchain and all the transactions that are occurring. Um, and this is necessary in order for us to secure the network, right? Because we don't have a central entity running it, it's all the nodes combined. But the issue with that is like, if you're transacting financial information, if you are interacting with a DAP and you need to like, you know, um, input some information or, you know, facilitate some sort of action, everybody's going to see that. Um, and so in these systems, they're not private. Um, they're more pseudonymous. So again, it's public, but I say pseudonymous because you have a public key. That's just a random uh, string of letters and numbers. But again, we can see all the transactions that are happening with that public key. So I might not be able to say that, oh, this public key belongs to Tiffany, but I know that this public key is doing all this activity. So it's still, it's kind of like in this blurred area, right? It's not private. Um, it has these public aspects and it's somewhat, you know, uh, obfus obfuscated through like the pseudonymity. But again, it's still not um, fully private. And so with Alio, for example, we want to make it so that we can still have this transparent blockchain, but have the data on it more private. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, where we are now. And for a lot of specific applications, privacy will be crucial to actually build, the, build them out. And so with with Alio then and all these the issues around privacy and um, you know exactly like you just explained what exactly is Alio offering then as far as a way to address the concerns over things being semi private not really fu fully private or fully public yeah, so to address this uh, pseudonymity uh, issue, so I think that's a term like people should maybe try to get familiar with. So something that's pseudonymous, right? It's it's not fully private, but it's not 100% fully public, right? But it has like these public um, aspects, kind of like I described. Um, so the way that Alio is going to enable privacy in Web3 is by providing a software stack for developers um, to actually build with this new cryptographic method called zero knowledge. Um, and so what is zero knowledge at a high level? It is a way for an individual to validate some statement or claim, so like a true or false statement, without having to reveal the information behind the statement. So to give an example of that, you know, I'll, I'll give like a very basic one. So, you know, I'm from the United States and in the U.S. you have to be 21 years of age or older to drink. And so normally, how would I prove to somebody that I'm 21? I would usually have to give them my ID. But on that ID, it has my full name. It has my street address. It has my birthday, you know, um, and all this other information that, quite frankly, the bouncer doesn't really need to know. They just need to know if I'm over 21. Um, but using zero knowledge cryptography, what you could do is I could generate a statement and that statement would be, I am over the age of 21, or I guess it would say I am uh, 21 or older because yeah, you could, you could be 21. So that would be the statement I'm trying to prove. And what you do is you generate something called a zero knowledge proof. 
right, of this statement. And the zero knowledge proof is just um, this, uh, like, mathematical computation um, that can actually be uh, computed such that you can tell if the statement is true or false. And the way that that works at a high level is basically, let's say I generate the zero knowledge proof to say that, okay, I'm over 21. Uh, I would use a proving key, this is an alias system, and then the person that I am trying to prove the statement to would use a view key. And without going into the details of it, essentially we've developed uh, this cryptographic primitive where essentially you take the proving key and the view key, um, and that view key can basically compute the zero-knowledge proof that we generated about the statement, and it will mathematically calculate and basically say whether or not the statement I'm saying is true. But when that happens, the individual that I'm trying to prove the statement to, they don't need, they don't know anything else about me, right? They don't know my birthday. They don't know my, they don't necessarily need to know my full name. They don't know my address or anything. All they know is, okay, they gave me this proof. It checked out. The claim was accurate. And so we can let them in the bar, assuming, you know, the person's over 21. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's how we're trying to do that. So for developers then to develop secure applications and address this concern over someone who's pseudonymous, you know, don't want to give too much information, I want to re remain private, but still prove, prove my point. Alio provides the tech stack for developers to be able to build applications that are able to do that. Correct, yep. Awesome. So I, I actually would love to understand too a little bit more about Alio itself as an organization and how it works to, you know, build something for the Web three, but also operate as a Web three company. What does it mean to have a decentralized organization like Alio? Yes, that's a good that's a good question. Basically, if you think about Web3 and this landscape more generally, typically what people are doing is they're building these, again, decentralized networks. Um, and those decentralized networks are primarily built by like one organization. So in the case of Alio, we have the Alio network, right, which is a completely open source network. So everybody can see the whole code base behind it and anybody can contribute to it, right? So we actually have contributors from all around the world that aren't necessarily employed by the company Alio, but are just advocates of the ecosystem and you know building out this network. And then you have Alio Systems Inc., the company, which is going, which also has people contributing to this open source network, but at the same time, we'll be developing independent products and services that we can then you know, bring to the Alio open source network and people can choose to utilize and work with us if it's helpful to them. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how you get the separation between like, okay, having a traditional company or organization selling products and services and also having this decentralized network. And the cool thing about the decentralized network is that uh, it has a native token associated with it. Uh, and in our case, that token will be used to run programs in the network. And so, the theory behind it is if a lot of people are using the Alio network and they're transacting with this token because they want to use like a different application or, you know, they're using it to, you know, pay nodes on the network to generate a zero knowledge proof for them, for example, then the value of that token will go up because it's kind of like a supply and demand thing, right? If there's more people in the network and there's a limited supply of tokens and people are using it, then the value of that network goes up. Um, and Alio as a company will also have a bunch of tokens. So in that case, we're able to generate revenue. And then we can also generate revenue from the products and services that we offer to people if they want to work with us. Again, they don't have to use our products and services. They can build their own solution in the network if they so choose. And I'm sure plenty of people will do that. And we definitely encourage that. Um, could, yeah. could you help me understand how are people actually incentivized? Is it through the coins? incentivized to build in the network like is it through just the coins or is there also other elements to it that incentivize them to actually build on the open network yeah so i think a lot of the incentives uh come from the ability to actually run a node on the network because by running a node what you can do is you can mine blocks 
um, and you can receive block rewards for that. This is kind of similar to how Bitcoin works, except in our case, we're um, grinding something called snarks, which is like a specific implementation of zero knowledge cryptography, as opposed to grinding SHA-256, which is a different cryptographic method that Bitcoin uses. So that's one way. And then the other way is by generating zero knowledge proofs for people. And we call this proofs as a service. So you can actually run a node on the network, assuming you have the requisite hardware and um, certain like software optimizations. And then basically you can generate zero knowledge proofs for users on the network and you'll collect a fee for doing that. Um, because average users probably won't want to generate zero knowledge proofs since it is computationally intensive. So that's one incentive. And then the other incentive is like if you build an application on the network um, and people are transacting with our token, like you can create your own unique business models to try and generate revenue. And then currently right now, we have set up a number of different incentive programs where like if you contribute to our open, so open source code or you're part of like a, our ambassadors program or you do all these different things, you can actually receive like um, tokens even before mainnet launch. So that's kind of how you can get like early adoption as well. Um, and then also there's incentives baked in through our consensus mechanism, which maybe I won't dive into all the details of that, but essentially like the way you come to agreement on how the network is going to function involves people taking their tokens and like staking them and doing different governance operations and so that's another way people are incentivized so there's multiple ways in which it can happen awesome so maybe we can talk about as well uh earlier before we before we hit record we were talking about how privacy is really one one piece of what web3 will be so what's your take on, you know, uh, there's so many sessions here about what, what Web3 is, what it's going to look like, and not everybody is talking about privacy, but some people are. Uh, what, what do you see as the greater picture and how it's evolving right now? Yeah, so I think generally, like even aside from specifically the privacy aspect of Web3, which again, I mean, that's sort of my uh, personal uh, area of interest just because you know I work at a company that's focused on privacy but web3 more generally is interesting because it gives more power to individual users um, and this uh, power you know comes from both like maintaining control over your own data and deciding what you want to do with that and how you can actually like personally benefit from monetizing your data which in web 2 like you have no control over right basically when you use an application run by these centralized companies that we all know and love um, on web 2 you basically are giving them the rights to all of your information whereas in web 3 you now have autonomy and that can open up a lot of interesting areas for people to to benefit um, and you know if people want your data, they're going to have to come up with interesting ways to incentivize you, right? So that's that's kind of cool. It's, it's giving more power to the people. Um, and then also, I think, you know, one specific area that I find fascinating is like creator economies. So because this is a completely decentralized network and anybody can participate and anybody can sort of like, you know, very easily launch a product um, and not have to like split revenues or follow certain guidelines outlined by a, a central company or organization, you have a lot of flexibility to, you know, um, find ways to, to draw people into your application and benefit collectively with all the other people in your ecosystem, uh, you know, through the launch of a token, for example, right? So in a creator economy, I could maybe, you know, develop some really cool, I'll just use a gaming use case, like I could create some like really cool gaming platform where the objective of this game that I created is for you to generate like uh, a cool avatar and then you like go into you know some sort of game world and like interact with people and if you can create some, like a really compelling environment um, and people want to join you can make it so that all right if you want to generate your avatar you have to like put up some tokens right and so if you draw like huge demand into this ecosystem and a lot of people are putting up their tokens then again the value of the tokens is going to go up because the ecosystem is really popular and in this sense like you as the creator can reap all those benefits of like your um, tokens going up, right? Because if you create the platform, you'll probably own a decent amount of them, but then all the other people in the ecosystem benefit as well. So it's sort of like a collective growth. Um, and that's sort of what's interesting. Whereas in like web two, this doesn't really 
exists. So I think that's sort of the most powerful thing or why people might be interested in Web3 <coughs> moving forward. And then one other area too that I personally like is identity in Web3. So basically, you know, especially with Alio solutions, like generating this fully private identity, but still being able to validate that you're a legit person and not a bot or somebody that's, you know, doing some malicious activity. Um, but again, still maintaining full autonomy over your personal information when it comes to, to logging into websites or participating in different ecosystems, I think is super cool. Um, so yeah, that, that's sort of like another, another cool spot. Awesome. And, um, Okay, and as things happen on the show floor at Viva Tech, we have to wrap this up very quickly, but I would say, Anthony, that this was an awesome first episode, and so we'll have to continue the conversation again. Uh, I definitely want to dive deeper into some of the things that we talked about today, so thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great chatting with you, and yeah, looking forward to future podcasts. Awesome. Okay, well... Thanks, everyone, for listening in. And, uh, yeah, this is another episode of Creating Web 3.